Hello there, and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the third panel of our conference, Croat is Belarus. We're coming back after a quick break with another panel in English, as you could have noticed. My name is Daniel, and together with my colleague here, Eric, we shall moderate and oversee this panel. As per usual, our dear speakers will have 15 minutes, each for presenting to us their insights, and after that, we'll proceed to debate and answer questions sent by our viewers. We encourage you to comment and ask questions, because what is science without a good debate? And today, with us, we have six fantastic speakers, starting with Dominika Kocoń from Jagiellonian University in Krakow, with her topic COVID-19 in Belarus as a source of social dissatisfaction, Second speaker is Alexandra Ochkovic, also from Jagiellonian University, uh, with a speech called Who Will Heal the Nation? Third one is Agata Pika from Univers Jagiellonian University, uh, with our presentation called Long Live Belarus, Peace, Love and Strength, Symbiosis of the 2020 Revolution and Meanings Behind Them. Fourth on our list is Adrian Misiak from Silesian University in Katowice. And his speech is called Human Rights in the Light of Belarusian Authoritarianism. Fifth one is Pekka Wilki from University of Tartu with a speech called Geopolitics Deconstructed, comparing the popular uprisings in Belarus and Ukraine and last but not least is Sara Pastiszewska from Jagiellonian University with a presentation called In Comparison of Recent Statements Made by International Organization. And that is all. Welcome everyone and welcome our viewers. So we can begin our panel with uh, starting with Dominika Kotsoin. Uh, with her speech, COVID-19 in Belarus as a source of social dissatisfaction. Okay, thank you for allowing me the floor. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, and thank you very much for uh, the possibility to participate uh, in this interesting conference. Um, today, I would like to talk about um, COVID-19 in Belarus. Um, and I would like to describe why um, the COVID-19 in Belarus may be called as a one of sources uh, of social dissatisfaction um, in this country. And now give me a second, um, I will show my presentation. Mm, yes. Is it visible? Yes, everything's fine. Okay, so, um, as we know, um, since May 2020 in Belarus, the anti-government protests are happening. Uh, of course, the current situation is made up of many, many factors, such as manipulation of the candidates laying up during the presidential election process or controlling vote results. But however, uh, it's also worth mentioning that the period of protests coincide with the coronavirus pandemic. Most European countries decide to introduce a lot of sanitary uh, restrictions before the middle of 2020 um, in order to minimize the number of uh, illnesses, but not Belarus. In my speech, I would like to try to describe the Belarusian government's approach to the epidemiological treat during the first three months of the pandemic uh, and to describe how uh, this has affected social moods in this country. Um, by the World Health Organization, COVID-19 was uh, regarded as a pandemic on 11 March 2020. Around the time, um, many cases of the disease started to appear in Europe, and, and it's why the European countries were introducing lockdown one by one. Um, at the end of March, uh, there were only two countries in Europe which had not decided to uh, introduce restrictions. It was Sweden and Belarus, and um, I think it's pretty clear that it's not possible to compare the approach of the 
gov governments of these two countries to the COVID uh, case. Uh, because, in short, uh, we can say that firstly, Sweden has an excellent health service and uh, Swedish soci society uh, is very disciplined. Um, despite the lack of uh, legal orders or prohibition or bans, etc., it takes a responsible approach to ensure recommended by World Health Organization restrictions. Unfortunately, this is not the case of Belarus, where the government has underestimated how serious the situation is and where the head of state during his official statements has described the international mobilization as a psychosis. Yes. Um, symptoms of public uh, dissatisfaction with the government approach to the COVID-19 issue could be very uh, could, could be seen very very quickly because um, Belarus, despite being an authoritarian state, isn't close uh, to information coming from free foreign media, yes? So week after week, when the situation in Europe was getting worse, uh, Belarusian society began to actually mobilize uh, itself to fight with the coronavirus and to fight with the government's narration. Um, and in this time, many Belarusian doctors uh, called for the wearing of masks, careful hygiene and uh, social distancing. and uh, I think in this moment is uh, worth to add that many of them, many of these doctors, uh, have been dismissed because of their appeals uh, or their expressions of dissatisfaction with the government crisis policy. But nevertheless, uh, doctors' appeals uh, reached to the majority of citizens and the society in protest against the uh, government's approach to the pandemic started to follow popular recommendation on their own. Therefore, in April, many Belarusians uh, wore masks or kept uh, social distance voluntarily. Um, moreover, many parents, uh, many Belarusians' parents, also left their children home for the sake of um, their uh, health. Um, at the beginning of the epidemic in Europe, between March and April, uh, Belarusian uh, government understated disease statistics. Uh, and this was mainly due to the low number of uh, COVID tests, of course, as everywhere, uh, but uh, also because a number of people who came for help to doctors or hospitals with the um, uh, symptoms of pneumonia were not tested or, or uh, were not even admitted to the hospital at all, um, despite words given by the Belarusian Minister on Health um, who said um, that, that no one in need will be refused hospitalization. He said that. Um, in addition, some of the deaths that could probably have been caused by the coronavirus have been connected to statistics on deaths from pneumonia or other diseases. Uh, it was also fitting um, to the narration of the Ministry of Health which maintained uh, that the situation is completely, completely stable. Um, in the official speeches, members uh, of the government emphasized many uh, times uh, the difference between mortality from COVID-19 and um, other diseases, uh, like uh, cancer, for example. And this way, they uh, wanted to prove that the coronavirus is um, not worth fearing. Um, it's also good to know that the isolation of people uh, who could be potentially ill was not obligatory in Belarus. Mm, any recommendation made to people coming to Belarus from abroad? No, any other restrictions, uh, in fact, uh, in this country. Everything was um, totally voluntary and mm, any control of law enforcement uh, do not exist. Um, in the whole bizarre situation surrounding the epidemic in Belarus, the statements uh, of the President Alexander Lukashenko has gained the, big, uh, the biggest popularity in the foreign media. In the uh, internet, we can find um, a lot of videos where Lukashenko speaks about the global psychosis and undermines the existence of the um, threat in, in words 
I do not see this coronavirus. Uh, the president has also given a few tips uh, on how to increase immunity. Uh, yes, uh, these tips included, for example, um, regular use of the sauna, farm works, or of course, decontamination with vodka. And uh, in the um, international area and on the foreign internet, Lukashenko's statement were a reason for, um, for creating an avalanche of jobs or memes and Belarusians were also aware of absurdity of the uh, president's statements, but in addition to the humor, many Belarusian uh, citizens saw uh, Lukashenko's attitude as a threat to human health and life. Um, and people have realized that Lukashenko can risk a lot to maintain his position in country. Um, and by the way, uh, it's good to know that government's attitude on coronavirus policy was not co consistent uh, at the beginning um, because in March, uh, the Minister of Health wanted a lockdown, but Lukashenko, who uh, has um, his own theory about the pandemic, of course, opposed it. Um, yeah, um, the specialists in Lukashenko's approach to COVID-19 um, are seeing his fear for his position uh, in Belarus. Um, and probably the president thinks that if he admits that there, there is something that he cannot control, it could contribute to collapse of the myth uh, of his, I don't know, greatness maybe. Um, and it's good to know that uh, this myth uh, was being created in Belarus for many, many years. Um, moreover, Lukashenko feared uh, for the uh, ec economic uh, downturn uh, that had already uh, affected his country in January 2020, because uh, then the Belarusian GDP fell uh, by six percentage points for, from the previous year. Um, and um, a lockdown, of course, would mean um, a quarantine of the majority of citizens and in consequence, a reduction in uh, domestic uh, production. And um, in my opinion, it's something uh, that the Lukashenko's government was trying to avoid. And um, the behavior of the government and the president in the first three months of the pandemic was openly criticized by the citizens. Uh, the paralysis of the health service directly uh, affected uh, the quality of treatment for patients, and moreover, the lack of uh, official restrictions meant uh, that COVID-19 was spreading rapidly in the country. Um, and interestingly, uh, according to a survey carried out by uh, 12 British and American universities, um 86 percent of Belarusians believe that the government's response to the uh, treat of the pandemic was insufficient um yes and today more than six months after the start of uh, demonstration uh, demonstrations in belarus uh, we all know that the lukashenko's approach to the epidemic has weakened his image even more in fact because uh, many people have seen the absurdity in which they have to live. Many people got sick and lost their jobs. Mm, the health service or business waited for uh, support from government forces, but in vain. Uh, the economic crisis and the very bad management of the epidemic became a prelude to the May and August, especially August protest. And therefore, I believe that the attitude of the Belarusian government uh, contributed to increase social tension and then escalation in the fury of the Belarusian people. Uh, the fury triggered by the arrest of the opposition leader and the, and the fraudulent presidential elections too. And then thank you very much for your attention and Daniel Eric, the floor is yours. Thank you very much.
thank you very much also. And now we will proceed to the next panelist, which is Alexandra Ochkovic from Jagiellonian University also, and her speech called Who Will Heal the Nation? Please go ahead. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, obviously, we are staying in the medical field, um, we can say. Let me just set, uh, share my presentation with you. Okay, is it visible? Yes, everything's fine. So that's great. So in my presentation, I would like to touch upon the topic of Belarusian medical care during the time of protest and regime crackdown. More specifically, I will be talking about the situation of Belarusian medical workers who decided to stand against the current political regime, how are they treated by the authorities, and how all of this is influencing the quality of medical care in Belarus. Um, here you can see the order, with my, uh, the order of my presentation, and I shall begin with certain troubles that healthcare system, Belarusian healthcare system, was already facing even, even before the protests. So despite the number of doctors and nurses, human resources in healthcare in the country are unevenly distributed. And there is a shortage in primary care in both in rural and in urban areas. Although the large workforce means that the overall cost of stuff is large, individual salaries are very low. To earn more, health workers usually have to take one and a half full-time jobs. Um, then there is a problem of lack of medical personnel. Some cities are missing up to 40% of the necessary personnel. Often it remains impossible to get an appointment with a doctor because there is simply no qualified doctor in town. Lack of personnel mentioned before influences also the quality of work of currently working doctors. Since there is not enough medical workers for patients, those who are working are simply overloaded with chores. Um, now we have medical workers taking part, part in protests. In August, when Belarusian protests over the rigged elections began and the government began to force the crackdown on the, protest, on the protests, some doctors also took to the street to protest against the violence with which the govern government was treating its citizens. Doctors called their action um, Doctors Against Violence, simply, uh, and on their banners they put slogans like Stop the Violence, Medics with the Nation, Medics Against Lawlessness, who will be treating you? I wanted to save people's lives, not people from Oman. Enough blood, and so on and so forth. You can see some of these um, some of these slogans uh, in the pictures. Also, peaceful medics marches occurred in bigger cities. The chains of solidarity of medics are also fre frequently taking place. Belarusian medics have also decided to go to protests to treat the wounded in clashes with the police especially dressed in white coats or other um, pieces of clothing that indicated that they are um, doctors. Well, to make it clear that they appeared here as doctors who are carrying out their duty to help. Well, they are still uh, being arrested by Omun without a word of explanation. Medical workers, along with other protesting people, are poorly treated during the time of arrest. And here I am not talking only about lack of the basis for the arrest, but also about the violation of bodily integrity. Um, one of the doctors who already fled Belarus recalls how he shouted to the officers not to break his arms because he's a doctor and he needs them for his work. Medical workers are also mistreated while in prisons, which is particularly problematic for doctors who need their bodies to perform their specializations. Uh, in the picture on the left, you can see Andrei Tkachov. Uh, he is a physiotherapist. And this is the picture taken after his stay in the arrest, after the detention. You can see the bruises all over his back. So practicing such an important profession as doctor, nurse, etc. is not a basis for better treatment. Healthcare workers are detained and sentenced to days in prisons. Um, the doctors are being given the maximum punishment under administrative code from 12 to 15 days of administrative arrest. As of November 18th, 21 health workers were in custody, but the, this number is constantly changing. The Belarusian Medical Solidarity Foundation website tries to keep um, people informed about the detained doctors. Well, only in the first week of November, more than 60, more than 60 nurses and doctors, oncologists, traumatologists, uh, dentists, radiologists, and other specialists were detained in Minsk, just in Minsk. 
Almond officers do not care who they beat. This is the result of the information provided in interviews by, by healthcare workers who came across them. Doctors emphasize that they appear at the protests in order to treat the wounded and not necessarily to protest. Meanwhile, they are treated as dangerous criminals. They also say that during detentions, um, and during the protests and also during the peaceful marches, um, medics have repeatedly heard from officers that if it was up to them, they would already be against the wall, which means that if they could, officers would execute medical workers. So the medical profession uh, as such is a profession of public trust and the doctors themselves constitute a kind of authority figures and are part of Belarusian intelligentsia. In the current situation, in the eyes of the police officer, uh, officers, the decline of this authority is clearly visible. The protesting doctors lost their authority and it can be said that we are dealing here with a conflict between brute force and intelligence. Oman officers are unaware of the sociological implications of using violence against doctors and seeing them as enemies. As one of the arrested doctors, Mr. Vitushko says, I turned from a respected specialist into an inconvenient citizen. Robbing this profession um, of the respect it deserves will cause nothing but harm. Now we have consequences of protesting for medical workers. Medical workers are being fined, fired from their jobs, and students, medical students, are being expelled from medical universities for ex exercising their civic, civic duties in their free time. It is very important to, to notice that they are doing all of this during their free time. During protests, peaceful marches, chains of solidarity, medical workers are brutally arrested. What usually follows it is jail time. This causes extreme disorganization of the work in the hospitals. In the hospitals, um, work of clinics or wards is totally blocked. Admissions to certain wards, for example, maternity, are totally suspended. Also, there are changes in the operating schedules as there are simply no doctors who could carry them out. So instead of treating the appointed patients, specialists sit in arrest. Um, Pre-arranged patients find out that the doctor is missing, hospital staff tries to redirect them to other facilities for the examination, but this increased the workload for doctors who are still working, causing them to be exhausted and increasing the risk of medical error. Next is the problem of dismissal of doctor specialists. The, the situation here is much worse because these doctors are unique and it is very difficult to replace them in Belarus. The arrest or layoff of specialists in specific fields will undoubtedly have an impact on healthcare and worsen its condition. During the trials of medics, phrases like there is no one to replace this doctor, he or she is highly qualified specialist can be, heard, can be heard very often, but these do not affect the decision of the judges. They will still get um, the administrative arrest. Well, patients lose the most from this situation. And well, such approach re will result in more long-term consequences also. Medical workers are leaving the country as they do not feel safe in Belarus. For example, Poland took steps to attract Belarusian medical workers, beginning with the Polish Ministry of Science and Higher Education, which published a letter from Wojciech Maksymowicz to foreign, to foreign students and scientists with a special message to citizens of the Republic of Belarus. The letter contains the main information on aid programs aimed at uh, attracting Belarusians to Polish universities. Such a move is of colossal importance because Belarusian medical students do not want to stop studying. It is clear, however, that if they do not receive education in their country in accordance with their consciousness, they will decide to end their education in another one because countries like, for example, Poland provide such an opportunity. In addition, on December the 1st, an amendment to the ordinance um, of the Minister of Development, Labour and Technology is to come into force in Poland, which exempts Belarusians, including, of course, doctors and nurses, from the obligation to obtain a work permit. In Poland, the basic problem for healthcare workers from Belarus was the long and complicated procedure of diploma nostrification, but it is to be simplified with the help of the so-called COVID law. Thanks to this, Belarusian doctors and nurses will be able to work um, with the consent of the Minister of Health without fully recognizing their diplomas. And by the way, the work agencies uh, are, are informing right now that they already have some people from Belarus, some doctors and nurses who are willing to wo work in our country. 
Poland obviously is not the only place where Belarusian medical workers want and might migrate. Medical workers who left the country long before this situation um, are noting that their colleagues start asking questions about the recognition of diplomas and conditions of work in countries like Spain or Germany. Sources inform that people who weren't thinking about leaving the country before are triggered by the current situation to start searching for other opportunities. So recently, more and more young medical workers uh, are learning German or Polish um, in order to boost their chances in foreign job market. What can also be noticed is the fact that protesting are mainly younger, you can say ambitious doctors, and most often it is them who talk about the possibility of leaving the country if the situation does not normalize. Of course, it will be a brain drain for Belarus. First off, what is the mess how the Belarusian govern government will react to such, such a behavior of medical workers? And of course, there is an answer from the government. Ministry of Health is now reshuffling most of the health service positions. The management of hospitals and medical universities is changing. One can ask whether this might be a new strategy for the fight with coronavirus, but it is very doubtly. But I would personally doubt it since um, people who have undergone these changes were usually the people who did not support the, uh, the authorities. And also these changes are very abrupt. So it is clearly political. These changes were clearly politically mo motivated. In addition, the president replaced three out of four vice chancellors of medical universities, as medical students appear to be very active protesters and previous vice chancellors were not sufficiently assertive towards them, apparently. Also in December, Alexander Lukashenko informs uh, the medics who have decided to leave that in this case they will not be able to return to Belarus. In his speech, he reduces the issue of the departures of uh, Belarusian healthcare workers only to financial matters. He states that this outflow, outflow is caused by the desire to get rich, thus not recognizing the problem of repression of doctors. This is an obvious simplification of the problem because the previ previously mentioned problems of low wages in the healthcare system has already occurred before, but at this point there is also the issue of rep repressing this group, group for performing the, their civic activities. At the end of the speech, he adds that this is not a threat, but only information, which considering the whole situation uh, in Belarus sounds not very convincing and certainly did not reassure the healthcare workers who still remained in the, in the country. He also claims that speaking of the impossibility of Belarusian doctors to return to Belarus, he means that they work there and earn a lot of money there and that they come to Belarus to obtain state uh, subsidized services. He says that the bitter truth is that in, in those, um, that is it, do, it is those who live in Belarus who pay for these services. These doctors do not. So doctors in, in fact prey on the Belarusian na nation. In this way, by the force of propaganda, doctors are turned into parasites who rob their own people first. Um, second, they are portrayed as egoists who left their own nation for money alone. Such thinking may become permanent in some way and will be definitely dangerous for, um, for the reputation of uh, medic healthcare workers. When it comes to conclusions, uh, well, such approach of government, repression and violence against medics will only deepen already existing troubles of healthcare system. Belarusian healthcare system will be facing even more serious lack of personnel, which will be harmful, especially to the Belarusians. There might not simply not be enough doctors to heal wounds of the nation. Um, if there will be a new ruling team after Lukashenko, uh, they will have plenty of work to do in order to first bring back medical workers to the country and then strengthen the, the healthcare system, who is now on the verge of collapse. Um, this will be, in my opinion, one of the most difficult tasks for a new Belarusian government if, if one will appear one day. So, thank you very much. That is all I wanted to say. Thank you very much also. Such grim news, all, all from Belarus, but let's hope we have something optimistic for a change. At least the topic says so. And next one is Agatha Pika.
with her speech called Long Live Belarus, Peace, Love and Strength, Symbols of the 2020 Revolution and Meanings Behind Them. You have a floor. Thank you very much. Um, I'm really honored to be part of the Kovadis Belarus conference. Uh, and right now I will talk a little bit about symbols. Uh, but before I start, please let me know if the presentation is visible. Yes, it is visible. Amazing. So, uh, for starters, here's the ABC of my presentation. <laughs> um, here are the symbols that I will focus on, because every revolution has its symbols. Um, from the historical French guillotine um, to the Georgian roses or the orange color used in Ukraine. And symbols may seem somewhat irrelevant, especially compared to the political significance of protests um, and revolutions and the danger that they pose. Uh, but in fact, symbols play a very important, a key role um, in two things. First of all, in uniting people um, during protests and revolutions, and second of all, in sending a simplified message to the outside world to sort of market the revolution and uh, give it a name, give it a symbol. And that's why today I would like to analyze the symbols of the 2020 Belarusian protests and explain meanings behind them and um, their significance. So let's start with F, like flag, or rather two flags because as you can see, we've got both the government's flag here and the opposition's flag. The government's flag uh, is the red-green flag with an embroidery uh, on one side, uh, and it has been introduced in 1951. As explained by the Belarusian historian, uh, Alexander Bystryk, uh, red was the color of revolution and green was for nature and life. They picked a folk ornament because the Soviets saw Belarus as a nation of peasants. Um, this flag has actually been exchanged into the opposition flag at some point. So now let's focus a little, a little bit on the uh, red-white flag. It has a longer history because it has been introduced as the flag of the short-lived Belarusian National Republic in 1918. Uh, and then when Belarus won independence from the Soviet Union, uh, it was readopted once again in 19. Uh, 91. But then, unfortunately, shortly after Lukashenko came to power in 1994, um, he held a referendum and, uh, based on this referendum, he changed the flag once again, returning the old um, red-green uh, flag with slight modifications because he got rid of the um, communist hammer and sickle and changed the embroidery a little bit. Currently, Lukashenko's propaganda um, against the opposition's flag uh, is focused entirely on the fact that the red-white flag was used um, by Belarusian Nazi collaborators, uh, and Lukashenko ignores completely the rest of this flag's history and its meaning to people. Uh, Lukashenko is, we can say, engineering a confrontation between these two flags uh, as a symbol of confrontation of protesters with his regime. Uh, we can head to the next point, which are, uh, which is G, like gestures. Um, you definitely recognize these women, or at least the one in the middle, who is uh, Svetlana Tikhanovskaya, uh, who heads a trio of women uh, with Maria Kolesnikova on the right uh, and Veronika Tsepkala on the left. Um, all of these women have adopted uh, quite um, recognizable symbols, signs, that they show in posters and at rallies. Uh, these are their sig um, sign signature gestures, we can say. So, uh, Tikhanovskaya uh, in the middle, the leader and presidential candidate, as we all know, has become known for her punched fist. The punched fist is the symbol of strength, of fight, of determination, time for a confrontation, we can say. 
Uh, Maria Kolesnikova, the campaign chief of ex-banker Viktor Babariko, who um, got barred from uh, elections and is currently in jail, uh, curls her fingers in a heart shape, showing a lot of love, positive emotions, um, love for one another in the society, but also for, um, for the country, we can say. And last but not least, Veronica Tsepkalo, whose ex-diplomat husband, Valery Tsepkalo, was also barred from uh, standing in elections. Uh, she shows a victory sign, uh, which can be interpreted as a way of saying, eventually, we, Belarusian people, are going to win this revolution. Uh, also, the victory sign can be uh, seen as the sign of peace. Uh, which is yet another way to highlight that the revolution, the protests, are supposed to be peaceful. Um, people don't want any bloodshed. This is a peaceful revolution. And these gestures, obviously very catchy, uh, have been adopted by demonstrators um, on the streets of Minsk and elsewhere. Uh, here you have two more pictures, one uh, during a rally and the other one during um, during a meeting with the press. And let's head to L, like long live Belarus, which is the motto um, used by protesters, uh, used by the people that is aimed at awakening a sort of national civic um, sense, a sense of consolidation of, of the Belarusian people um, in order for them to protect their freedom, their independence um, in the country, as well as their language, their history, their symbols, such as the flag, and uh, their national culture. Uh, this slogan, Long Live um, Belarus, uh, has been in use since the 19th century. And uh, on the screen, you can, you can see that it's uh, also, um, it's, it's not only used in, in English, but obviously, um, uh, you, you can see it here in the um, European transcription and uh, the original one, Jevie Belarus. Next we've got N, like Nina Baginskaya. Uh, you can recognize this woman from the poster of our conference. Um, Nina Baginskaya is a 73-year-old woman. Uh, who has been arrested a dozen of times uh, over the years for displaying the opposition's flag in public, which is illegal in Belarus. So currently she's required to pay half of her pension uh, in order to pay off um, the accumulated fines. Mm, and she was present uh, in the streets during the 2020 protests as well. She's very active and uh, here you can see um, uh, the, the picture from our poster that represents uh, Nina Baginskaya. S, like Svetlana, I have already talked about her a little bit. Um, this woman decided to run for president after her blogger husband, uh, Sergei Tikhanovsky, was jailed and uh, barred from contesting in the elections. Um, what made her so special uh, and what accounts for her success is that she's not from the elites. Uh, she's an English teacher and interpreter, and she has two children. Um, so her background is clearly associated uh, as part of her success within the society. Uh, people accepted her as she seems to be one of them, unlike Lukashenko. And she is the symbol of change, of something fresh. She's a brave woman ready to take matters in her own hands and make her country um, a good democratic place, um, suitable for people to live in. What's the Belarusian uh, revolution without Telegram, guys? Uh, Telegram is a free cross-platform and cloud-based app for communicating. Uh, it allows encrypted calls and chats, uh, making it safe for protesters to communicate with each other uh, without being tracked. It was launched in 2013, and since then, especially during the Belarusian protests, it gained a lot of popularity. Uh, actually, five, day, five days ago, Telegram announced that it had reached about 500 million monthly users worldwide. Why monthly? Because Telegram allows you to create um, an account for one month or longer, if you wish. And after the time that you choose, um, the account gets destroyed for your safety. 
So um, thanks to Telegram, Belarusians don't have to appeal to major information channels, which obviously are the source of Lukashenko's propaganda. Uh, thanks to Telegram, uh, almost every neighborhood in Belarus, uh, all local communities have their own channels today uh, through which they can formu formulate their own agendas. And um, I believe that through the Belarusian protests and uh, the vast usage of Telegram, um, it got more popular even uh, within the Polish society and started being used during uh, female protests related to abortion rights. Uh, recently in Poland as well. And now, speaking of women, um, the Belarusian revolution would be nothing without them, as they uh, showed uh, an amazing uh, sign of unity and determination together and played a crucial role um, during these protests. Uh, they often dressed in white, uh, as white as the symbol of purity, peace, uh, lack of violence, um, and they marched the streets together, holding hands, chanting songs and slogans, um, often carrying flowers, as you can see in the pictures, uh, gathering together um, and protesting against the regime, uh, showing that strength also lies in, in this delicacy, we can say. Um, and um, they also confronted uh, the police together by forming um, live human chains, holding hands together uh, and blocking other groups of people from the police, uh, protecting them. They also uh, handed flowers to the policemen um, as a sign that um, this revolution goes way beyond uh, regular animosities between people. Um, and they played a very important role uh, in these uh, protests, in this revolution. Um, so to summarize, what did the symbols account for? Uh, first of all, definitely huge determination of people because um, the scale uh, in which people uh, in Belarus used these symbols uh, was huge. You could see flags everywhere. Um, portraits of Nina Baginskaya, um, the, the gestures were repeated frequently uh, and people um, continued to protest for weeks, for months, and they still do. Um, also, these symbols show a clear will to create people's own legitimate government and democratic country, finally. Um, Almost on every step of the way, people uh, highlighted that these were peaceful protests. Uh, the flowers, the white color, um, the songs that they sang um, showed that they're here to be better than Lukashenko, not use um, any, any violence, but to peacefully uh, fight for um, what they believed in. And last but not least, uh, these were incredibly, incredibly progressive protests. Uh, first of all, the main symbol of them was Svetlana Tikhanovskaya, a woman ready to take over Lukashenko's regime, to be um, the head of the country. Um, and not only her, but all the women, all the women who took part in protests um, were a very strong uh, feminist sign, feminist symbol. Uh, of these events. So thank you very much for your attention. Um, here are the sources um, that I used to present, to, to create this presentation and the sources of the images. Uh, and I believe that's all. Thank you so much. Thank you thank very you much so for your speech. And now we have some hope to cling on to as we proceed to the human rights in the Light of Belarusian Authoritarianism by Adrian Misiak from Silesian University in Katowice. Please go ahead. Uh, hello, everyone. First of all, I want to say thank you for uh, for having me. Uh, this is really important, I guess, to, to, to speak about the problem in Belarus, of course. Uh, my presentation is about uh, the human rights in Belarus. I, as you'd say by reading the title of my presentation, 
uh, but uh, we should first start. Uh, of course, just give me a second to open my presentation. Mm. Yep. So here it is. Uh, the human rights line of Belarusian authoritarians. Uh, this is a quick uh, shortcut about uh, the most important legislative act, which actually are linked with uh, uh, to the situation of, of the human rights in the Belarus refugees. Uh, I really, it's really important, as I said before, and it's uh, regarding to, to the speech of the previous uh, Ms. Sagata, uh, previous speaker, uh, this is really uh, like more uh, documentary presentation about the, uh, the specific of the human rights uh, in the light uh, of the legal act. So, uh, as uh, the, the beginning of my presentation is uh, is, is, is a documentary uh, a documentary about uh, the human rights as you can uh, as you can uh, see. And uh, the first of the convenient uh, regulating human rights in Belarus is uh, International Convent on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. And this is uh, one of the two human rights pacts were decided in 1947. Uh, right. This is really important. And this is like a um, milestone for the human rights. The, the second one is the International Convention of the Elimination of the All Form of Racial Discrimination. Uh, this is a convention which actually is a third generation of the human rights instrument. It oblig uh, obligates uh, its members to eliminate racial discrimination and to promote understanding and mutual respect among all races. And the third one is the Convention on the Elimination of All Form of Discrimination Against Women the first international convention adopted by resolution uh, of the United uh, Nations General Assembly in December. Uh, all of those, all these, uh, all these conventions and legal acts are quite significant since the, the, the Belarusian government actually signed it and the, and the Belarusian government uh, in the image of the, the Lukashenko, and uh, this is the image of the Lukashenko. So actually, uh, from the from the nineties, it, it, it's uh, it's it's completely the same. It hasn't changed uh, hasn't changed for the while. So uh, it's really uh, important and still exists after all. Uh, the the fourth is the international convenience of the civil and political rights. Mm, the, the treaty was actually adopted as a result of the result of the United Nations conference in New York, as you can read, uh, in the 1966. And all these uh, continent legal acts, and so on and so on, uh, refers to, to the current uh, of the timeline, as and it's, it's really referred to to the current time. Besides the fact that it actually was signed many many years ago, but uh, they, they still has uh, the, they still have a power to uh, to, to to be um, the basic tool for the people to fight about the, the rights of the human being. Uh, the International Convention Against Torture and Other Cruel, Inhuman, or Degrading Treatment of Punishment. Uh, is all is also signed by the Belarusian was actually signed by the Belarusian uh, government. Mm, so it's it's also important. There is the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Uh, this is an international convention adopted by the uh, General Assembly on the, the November twenty. The convention actually guarantees the rights of the child regardless of the color of the skin. And the convention requires the right and strain to be quarantined without any discrimination. There is uh, also the convention on the rights of the person with disabilities. Uh, the convention on the rights of the person with, with disabilities. 
uh, United Nations International Human Rights Treaty aimed at protecting the rights and dignity of people with disabilities parties to the convention are committed to promoting, protecting and ensuring the full um, enjoyment of human rights by persons with disabilities. And uh, the, the, last, uh, uh, the last but not least, I guess, there is the constitution which, which actually provides the human rights in the Belarusian society. Uh, it seems to be strange, but actually it is indeed. Uh, so the human rights are guaranteed by the constitution of the Belarus and are mentioned above uh, all the mentions in the chapter, the, the second chapter, the person society state. So this is the basic law which actually guarantees civil, economic, social and cultural rights. Uh, and it's really strange. There is a many, many cases which actually shows that this is uh, just a piece of paper without any power indeed. And uh, there's the institution, uh, the organization actually, which, which is called Legal Transformation Center, uh, which is the leader the, of the organization, Lena Tanchenkova. She is actually a Russian woman who has been dealing with the human rights violation virus for almost over 20 years. Uh, the activist was expelled from the Belarus. <laughs> and the, 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 this is really funny. Uh, because the pretext of getting rid of her uh, was uh, the exceeding the speed limit several times of the road and she was expelled uh, from the Belarus. Uh, it's beyond my comprehension, actually. Uh, but this is, this is true. Um, as I said before, the, the Tan Tan, Tan Kanchoba is the head of the organization Legal Transformation Center. Uh, which actually advise other Belarusian non-governmental organizations on the legal issues and the response to the human rights viol uh, violations, uh, which actually are pretty common in Belarus, especially uh, in terms of the current situation of the Belarus uh, leading to the election and so on and so on. Uh, the the other the <coughs> excuse me the other situation. It's actually worth to outline is uh, the organization and the situation of the human rights in organization Biasna. Uh, the leader, the Alex Bieltański, is a Belarusian social activist, activist and a human rights defender. He is the director of the Center of the Defense of the Human Rights. Uh, he was twice nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, the Bielski, uh, Bielski was arrested in the August uh, 20. Uh, 11 and sentenced for four years in the prison and Amnesty International con uh, consider him as a prisoner of the constant. What is actually said in the world about the human rights in the Belarus? The Council of Europe says there is a serious problem with the human rights in Belarus. The Freedom House says that uh, the Belarus has the most enslaved internet in Europe. United Nations, the independence of the media in the Belarus is impossible. Amnesty International, against the next death penalty in the Russian case, the Belarus is not yet fulfilling its obligation to hold democratic elections, the Human Rights Watch. Uh, there is no, there are no systemic change that shows a readiness to improve the human rights situation. And of course, there is uh, there is the U.S. State Department, which actually says that political interference and the lack of independence is really uh, like important. It's it's really uh, seeing in the in the Belarus. Uh, the elections, the elections are really interesting. Also, since on the July 10th, the 19th. Ninety-four, that Alexander Lukashenko was elected for the first time, and uh, he won uh, 80 80 percent of the votes in, in the whole in the whole number. But since then, uh, there is since then there is no other presidential or parliamentary elections or referendums held in the Belarus, and uh, he he has the power from from the nineties, and he's still strong or maybe even stronger than than in the in the in the past so 
uh, what's about the censorship in Belarus in, in light in the terms of the, the human rights? There is a freedom of speech granting by the constitution, as I said, uh, but actually according to the Article 32, uh, the, the 30, 33rd of the constitution, monopolization of the media by the state, social association or individual citizens as well, and the censorship is not allowed. And in 2011, the presence of the censorship was one of the reasons why Deutsche Bank and the Royal Bank of Scotland officially uh, civil relation with the country. Uh, there is actually the issue of the freedom of the press, like since 2000 reporters without borders has ranked Belarus below all other European countries in the press freedom index. Uh, freedom House has rated Belarus as not free in all its studies since. 1988, state media are subordinate to the president, harassment and censorship of independent media is rooted. Uh, so it's it's really, it's really, I think, uh, the freedom of the press and all the human rights are, are really um, in, in danger in the Belarus. Um, and, and after all, I find myself very convenient to say that uh, these kinds of action, like for, for a conference, for instance, really, really help to uh, enhance the, the knowledge of the society about the problem. Uh, the other thing is the repression against journalists, which is actually connected with the freedom of the press, of course, like um, arbitrary detentions, arrest, harassment of journalists. Are, this is a norm in the Belarus. Legislation aimed at combating extremist applies to independent journalists, including material deemed to be contrary and the honor of the president of Belarus. Mm, actually, there's include a law. This is the, the there is the law in the Belarus on insulting the president after five years in a prison and another of criticizing Belarus abroad. It's up to two years in prison. There is also the uh, repression still it still goes. The state will maintain a monopoly of the media of the internet, as well as the as the distribution and printing system. For example, uh, limits not only Belarus on independent publication, but also the the work of the foreign media correspondents. Uh, the application for accreditation of foreign media and the Belarus Ministry of Foreign Affairs are rejected. As a result, many foreign journalists are forced to work illegally. And it creates a, an, another issue, is, which, which is actually really uh, mm, distinguished the situation uh, in, in the Belarus, that we are not aware what, about the situation. Uh, it's, it's really important to, mm, to enlarge our knowledge, as I said. And it's, it's, really, it's really a thing. And the censorship of the films and the literature in the, in the July 2009, the supervisory body was created in the Minsk, which strictly controls all films and literally works uh, that enter the country. Without state registration of a film in the Belarus, it's impossible to organize illegal film screening, even for free. The opposition media claims that there is a recent list of the cultural figures whose uh, works and are banned from being performed in the Belarus of critical reason. There is also a music censorship. In the past few years, many Belarusian music musicians and rock bands have been unofficially banned from radio and television. Concerts have been withdrawn and the interview censors in the media. Belarus government policy is inclined to divide Belarusian musicians into pro-government, official and pro-democratic, unofficial countries. There is also economic barriers, barriers, and and many other things that actually stop from making music and making a journalistic job, and it's really, it's really uh, hard to pass through. There is also the violation of the work and rights, uh, like for example, mandatory employee subscription in the in the state print media, forced membership of the employees in the pro-governmental social organizations and associations. For dissemination among employees of state lotteries, 
forced participation of employees in the mass social events organized by, by local authorities or pro-government organization and association, lack of protection of employee interests by state trade unions due to the complex subordination of state control, and uh, also the harassment of employees for creating a membership in independent trade unions and opposition organization, as well as the pressure for demonstration and active civil position by the uh, there is, the, there is uh, the, also the problem, the death penalty in terms of the human rights uh, since the, the Belarus the last country in Europe, which actually still imposed and carry out the death penalty. Uh, so in 2015, for example, uh, there is there was uh, at least two death sentences. Uh, the 2016 four, according to Amnesty International, also 2017 from three to five, 2018 four, 2019 three, and 2020. Uh, there's also three death sentences. But uh, the friend of mine, which which actually lives in the Belarus and came from Belarus, uh, said is that there is really a problem in Belarus. But actually, it, it, it is really many more. For example, for the local uh, local environment, and this is everything for uh, this is everything. Uh, and I uh, I hope that they like it. And thank you for your attention and your time. And this is the sources. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now we proceed to the next one. And the next panelist is Pekka Virki from University of Tartu with his speech and it's called Geopolitics Deconstructed Comparing the Popular Uprisings in Belarus and Ukraine. Please go ahead, you have the floor. Yes, thank you. It's an honor to be here. Uh, can you see my presentation? Um, not yet. Okay, just wait a little bit. Can you see anything? No, no. Okay. Not okay. at this moment. Try to share it again. Mm -hmm. Okay, how about now? I think something. Yes, the, now we see it. Everything's fine. Yes, thank you. And you can see it. Yes. Yes, okay, great. Sorry, my camera doesn't work, so you'll have to. Uh, just for the presentation. So basically, uh, I am going to talk about uh, how geopolitical nature of these Belarusian uh, events, uh, protests are understood, and as they are often uh, contrasted with the events in Ukraine, uh, the so-called Euromaidan uh, revolution or the revolution of dignity uh, taking place in 2014, uh, I took this comparative approach here. And uh, first, I'm going to uh, provide a short uh, literature review uh, about uh, this uh, geopolitical nature and geopolitical position in terms of identity and uh, Lukashenko regime uh, legitimization and uh, so on. And uh, then there is an empirical part of my presentation, which will consist of uh, analysis, qualitative con content analysis of these uh, official uh, documents. Uh, provide, uh, by the uh, European Union and the United States of America and uh, two uh, prominent Western think tanks. Uh, first of all, uh, the Jamestown Foundation and secondly, the Atlantic Council. So uh, basically, the official line endorsed uh, by everyone, the opposite leaders uh, of Belarus, uh, the European Union uh, and the US uh, officials is that uh, the protests in Belarus are not geopolitical. And uh, as mentioned, they are often contrasted with the Ukrainian events, which are uh, like uh, with no further explanation seen as geopolitical. Uh, I approach this topic uh, through the lenses of uh, critical geopolitics, uh, which is a theory uh, built on Foucauldian presumption that uh, as any concept geopolitics uh, is uh, subject of discursive uh, act of framing or reframing the reality itself. And therefore, there is no geopolitics as such, but uh, it's a question of definition and uh, reframing of the concept. And uh, when you uh, hear all these policymakers talking that these are not geopolitical, it uh, 
uh, at least for me, it sounds that uh, they are trying to say something that they are not uh, able to uh, reframe otherwise. And uh, that's used as a code for something. But what is that? That's the question here. Uh, also, I'd like to make you familiar with the concept of uh, geopoliticization, which is uh, directly uh, derived from the uh, Ulla Weber's uh, famous securitization theory, that, uh, which means the discussive uh, construction of an issue as a geopolitical matter. And uh, there is this uh, competition uh, between different uh, institutions, experts and so on, uh, all, all the way going that how the events uh, in Belarus and this case, for example, in Ukraine too, uh, are presented. And that's uh, for, uh, reflected in uh, every debate. Uh, and uh, I use the definition uh, or this uh, three criteria presented by uh, David Cartier, uh in his article about uh, geopoliticization of EU's Eastern Partnership, and Belarus is, of course, an imp important part of that uh, project too. Uh, there's three criteria that uh, have to be fulfilled, uh, more or less, uh, for a, a matter to be uh, geopolitical, according to him. First of all, uh, it should uh, project or seek to deter hard power. So basically the most uh, the clearest example of hard power is uh, military matters and uh, strategy. Uh, reflect object or concerns re re related to territoriality. So the territorial element has to be there and uh, consist of actions taken against or at least in consideration of other powers. So there is the element of uh, external interference or at least potential for that. Well, uh, here's the short bibliography. I <laughs> have no time to uh, discuss about everything, of course, uh, but uh, this is the uh, basic uh, skeleton I used for this analysis. Uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, talk about the relationship between uh, this uh, Western policy of uh, so-called democracy promotion, and then later I'm going to uh, talk about uh, Russian autocracy promotion. And of course, as these uh, Belarusian protests are uh, part of democracy movement, uh, there is this question that uh, whether uh, Western democracy promotion poli policies have uh, furthered them or whether they have nothing to do with that. And there is an interesting article by uh, Joffe about this uh, comparison. It was uh, written already be before uh, the Belarusian protests uh, emerged. Uh, but um, <clears throat> uh, and and uh, I wouldn't take it uh, like uh, too seriously, but uh, it provides some interesting points uh, that uh, make the dividing uh, distinct Ukraine from Belarus, and uh, especially uh, in Ukraine, this uh, both the Huntingtonian civilizational line and uh, the geopolitical uh, competition are seen as. Uh, uh, going through uh, between uh, the regional uh, fragmentation and in Belarus, this uh, regional fragmentation is absent. So uh, the relationship between these uh, geopolitical struggles and democracy promotion is contested. And uh, I also selected this Joffe uh, text because I think it uh, probably, how to say this diplomatically, uh, reflects the um, views of certain external state actors quite well, and they are trying to uh, put in an academic framing there. Uh, well, if we look at the Lukashenko's uh, regime self-perception in geopolitical matters, uh, it's uh, the legitimation of Lukashenko's uh, uh, geopolitics and uh, Lukashenko regime itself is uh, that it presents it uh, as a last bast bastion against uh, Western capitalism. And uh, this is part of this uh, so-called uh, Marxist geopolitics, uh, uh, like uh, the geopolitics seen through class struggle lenses. And also there is this, uh, or has been this uh, uh, element of promoting uh, inclusive vision of Eurasianism, which is uh, much less aggressive and uh, not uh, imperialistic in a manner that the uh, Russian Eurasianism is, for example, the theories of Dugin, but they, it, it's more like 
the uh, Gorbachev's idea about the common European home and this uh, continental uh, peaceful coexistence. And these have been uh, how Lucas and Castro regime has tried to uh, present itself. Well, uh, also the European borders uh, in general, the Eastern Partnership Program and uh, have played an important role in these debates, and there is uh, quite amount of uh, academic literature re related to them uh, concerning the geopoliticization of the program. And uh, there is always this paradox that uh, although the European Union has been presented as geopolitical actor, uh, the founding principles of European Union were actually anti-geopolitical because uh, the Second World War uh, was seen as a result of geopolitical struggle and geopolitics itself, and the European Union has uh, tried to prevent these kind of consider considerations to reemerge. So uh, it is problematic, but uh, it has been claimed that uh, actually some so-called narrative entrepreneurs uh, within EU institutions geopoliticized this uh, European uh, Eastern Partnership program, and in case of Belarus. Uh, it has been a problem that uh, these uh, uh, programs are very uh, value-based. So uh, the European Union and Belarusians have both, uh, Belarusian authorities have both uh, tried to concentrate on technical matters. And there is this vision about uh, so-called spillover effect that it might someday expand from this further, more fruitful cooperation. Well, uh, one of the most important uh, and uh, interesting uh, perspective is provided by Kolsto, uh, which is uh, the uh, claim that the Russian autocracy promotion uh, in its neighbor neighborhood is actually motivated by geopolitics itself, as it is taken for granted in Russia that democracies are more likely to turn westward. And uh, he uses an example, uh, those de facto states uh, like uh, resulted from frozen conflicts, uh, Transnistria and uh, Abkhazia and so on. Uh, that they can ex actually uh, enjoy more uh, democracy in comparison to uh, Russian satellites or other neighboring states and those uh, uh, Eastern Bloc countries during the Cold War, as they are dependent on Mos Moscow in every case. So there is no need uh, for Russia to interfere and promote authoritarianism in them because their uh, statehood itself is tied on Russia. Well, if this theory is true, then it has a serious implication of Be Belarus and Ukraine and uh, to try to keep uh, Belarusian uh, development anti-geopolitical is very hard if we take the premise of Colston seriously. Uh, again, the system, uh, system of governance uh, is uh, important here. And uh, there is this concept uh, called post triumphalist geopolitics uh, mentioned by Natalie Koch, um, which is based on this uh, idea that after the Cold War, it was not about economic systems anymore, but uh, the Manichaean struggle of autocracies and democracies has taken the place in the world. And uh, Belarus and Ukraine are, of course, in the geopolitical, geographical, and uh, especially symbolic front line of this struggle. And uh, I say that uh, when we see the Biden administration uh, raising the power in the United States, this is probably this manichaeanism even go further, but uh, we'll see. And uh, the empirical part of my uh, analysis was based on, as mentioned, uh, the official statements and resolutions of certain actors in the Europe, European Union and uh, in the United States, and then I'm also taking the voice of expert community in the consideration. And uh, Atlantic Council and Jamestown Foundation are very uh, well-known, important Western think tanks that uh, are quite uh, well reflected, I'd say, uh, to the uh, views of policy community. Uh, and expect expert community in the West. Well, first about the official statements. Uh, in case of Belarus, uh, there is no predetermined choice and only integrity and right of self-determination of Belarusian people and uh, Belarusian territory are emphasized. This is in contrast with Ukraine, clearly, 
that uh, even before there was a military conflict in Crimea or in eastern Ukraine, uh, there was this uh, notion of European choice or European future on a transatlantic basis. Uh, so in that sense, uh, the statements regarding Belarus have been less geopolitical. Uh, on the other hand, uh, if you look at the resolutions, for example, this European Parliament resolution on September 17, uh, there is this implicit recognition for uh, Russian activeness uh, because the uh, resolution is uh, directed to be sent to the uh, Russian Federation. So there is this uh, third actor present. Uh, also, geopolitics uh, is present in the uh, rhetorics by explicit denial. So in case of Ukraine, there was no such explicit denial that this is not about geopolitics. In case of Belarus, it has been uh, stated. And uh, in either case, not before uh, the Crimea crisis in Ukraine or in Belarus, there has been uh, public statements about uh, hard power goals visible. So that's, that's completely uh, absent. Well, think tanks uh, are in stark contrast with this. In the case of Belarus, the geopolitical nature is taken for granted, basically. And uh, all the hard power considerations, uh, territoriality, the role of third actions, they are actively discussed and reflected in the expert community. And of course, this is uh, natural that uh, there is no need for such diplomatic sensitivity as uh, official institutions here. Uh, and uh, while these uh, denials, uh, for example, by uh, Svetlana Tsiarnovskaya are uh, cute, they are complemented with <laughs> actually uh, downplayed in a way that, uh, yes, she says that, but of course there is a geopolitical element. Uh, and uh, Belarusian nation building, like Ukrainian one, are uh, presented in the context of uh, uh, in relation to Russian imperialism and Russian nation building, and even uh, there is this repeated notion of continuing so the Soviet collapse, which uh, you know, I don't know if that's not geopolitical, then what is? So Belarusian protests are seen as inherently geopolitical by the, uh, these uh, experts that I, I went to, through and this think tank material. Uh, paradoxically, these considerations weren't that present, uh, that visibly present even during the uh, Ukrainian uh, Euromaidan. And uh, in Ukraine, the uh, relationship between domestic reform and geopolitics was uh, more openly discussed. In the case of Belarus, uh, it's not; it's more hidden. And uh, just some conclusions. Uh, in the case of Belarus, uh, this uh, diplomatic language is very carefully formulated and there is this clear avoidance of geopolitical references, uh, even going as far as uh, explicitly deny, de denying this uh, geopolitical nature. But there is a stark contrast between the official statements uh, and the uh, expert community. And uh, that kind of distinction didn't exist during the Ukrainian uprising. Uh, if you look at the framework of geopoliticization, uh, it is possible to see these express statements as uh, so-called geopoliticizing acts, but uh, the uh, official uh, officials ha had yet to uh, adopt that view. And I'd say that uh, on uh, publicly stated level, they won't do that. And if we ob ob observe the three criteria mentioned in in the beginning, projecting or seeking to deter hard power, territoriality, and the third actors, uh, they are all applied for analyzing in Belarus events, uh, and they are even stronger present than in the case of Ukraine. So it is very problematic to say that uh, Belarusian protests and Belarusian events uh, this year and the last year are not geopolitical. At least that's not how it is seen by Western think tanks. And uh, in case uh, of any further questions and uh, willingness to discuss, here is my contact information. And uh, I think that's all I have to say for now. Thank you. Thank you very much for this fantastic insight.
it's always a pleasure to host international guests. It really expands all of our horizons. And now, last but not least, Sara Fasciszewska with her speech called The Comparison of Recent Statements Made by International Organizations. Please go ahead. Sorry, I had some uh, technical issues. However, um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sara Fasciszewska, and I'm very grateful for giving me this opportunity to represent my academic work on this conference. Um, my main aim is to make the comparison of various and recent official statements of international entities, speaking more frankly of international organizations about the events in Belarus concerning the topic of human rights. So you can treat my presentation as, um, uh, as an enlargement of issues which were mentioned before. Um, the first thing... I'm sorry uh, to interrupt, but actually uh, we don't see a presentation, so there might be some problems. Oh. So wait could. a minute, please, because I don't know why. Sorry. It showed up for a second and it disappeared, so... Thanks, I will try again. I'm sorry. Um, okay. And right now? Yeah, now it works. Everything's fine. Go Perfect. ahead. Perfect. Okay. So, to start with, I ask myself if the public statements which were made by international community were purely symbolic, symbolic and consequently they dare the will to prevent any further escalation of the crisis. Or maybe simply I didn't understand it well and they did something to influence um, the development of the crisis of the issues in Belarus. Um, in order to draw your attention to this topic, I will uh, make the comparison of two international non-governmental organizations, such as Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch. Then I will confront them with two intergovernmental organizations, such as OCEE, which stands for the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. Then I will end my presentation a few recent statements made by OHCHR, which stand for Office of the United Nations High, Commission, High Commissioner for Human Rights. However, um, uh, furthermore, I will, um, I will simply call them UNN Human Rights Office. Um, so to start, uh, to start with Human Rights Watch, Firstly, it is possible to re read down here the statement made by Hugh Williamson, who is a, a director at Human Rights Watch uh, of the region of Europe and Central Asia. He boldly declared that um, other or, or international organizations such as United Nations and the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe should urgently set in motion inquiries to ensure that evidence is collected that could contribute to accountability for grave human rights violation. Then he continued that ensuring justice for victims and accountability for those responsible for human rights violation is Belarus is fundamental. So, what is uh, what we can learn from these statements? Because for for uh, when one reads them for the first time, they appear to say nothing, to be purely symbolic. But then we have to think about um, obligation and capabilities of Human Rights Watch. Uh, human Rights Watch is an organization. Who, uh, who focus on investigation and reports on abuses happening in the world. So they simply refuse, um, so they simply collect data about uh, urgent issues on the world. To um, guarantee they and ensure the independence, they refuse governmental funding or um, other different kind of donations which uh, could be not um, independent. However, 
uh, they seem uh, they work is simply to um, to make clear that the violation of human rights must not be accepted nor tolerated. They do not have any rights or legal obligation to go far far. Um, in other in other words, they are not a governmental entity to interfere um, in more direct way than make available the knowledge about recent human issues. So if we take into account the rights uh, which they have, they have done more than they could. Then we move to Amnesty International, which is, the, which is another non-governmental organization. Actually, um, the work of Amnesty International can be divided into groups. The first one is the submission of the briefing in accordance with the call for submissions issued by UN Human Rights Office. This is the first uh, example of the text which you can read. Um, uh, so what have done uh, um, what, what have done Amnesty International? They have collected numer numerous testimonies which they selected from video footage, photographs, images, and medical records. So they seem, uh, so they um, worked very, uh, very much to increase the general comprehension ab uh, about this issue in Belarus abroad. Then um, they also um, started and promoted the idea of petitions, um, which was signed by nearly 200,000 signatures by different entities, but also um, private persons. So this is uh, the first two examples of uh, the activity of statements made by non-governmental non entities, which, as I said before, do not have truly a um, very major impact to change the way international relationship works. However, now we move to OCE, uh, OCE which, um, uh, which is the platform for inclusive dialogue and joint action, as it is possible to see to uh, write down of a Helsinki fi uh, final act which was the treaty who, uh, which funded uh, OCE. It is, uh, first of all, OCE um, does not have any sanctions um, or different legal actions to criticize its, mem its, uh, its members who do not fulfill the, uh, the obligation towards human rights, because simply the fulfillment of this obligation is in good faith. So they could not exercise any legal measures against um, Belarus um, authorities. However, um, first of all, uh, it is possible to read down the, um, the statement which they uh, clearly declared that Belarusian authorities uh, has to, have to meet the international obligation and OSHI commitments to respect human rights and fundamental freedoms. What, what is important to notice from here that um, the department, which is um, uh, the department which is responsible for human rights uh, once again offers to provide expertise and tools to help strengthen human rights and democratic institutions in Belarus for the future of all citizens. So from this statement it is possible to understand they, they don't, do not only um, uh, can say that the authorities of Belarus do not comply with international human rights obligation and that human rights were constantly uh, violated there. However, they also offer help, offer aid um, to end this uh, crisis. Um, then the second document is more than a document than a statement. It's fundamental because it's a report which um, um, which offers 
a very broadened point of view about all these topics. As it was mentioned before, Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International um, work toward a more broadened accession to information, to objective information, and all this um, all this data collected by them was uh, consequently used by OCEE uh, to mark a legal framework about these issues. So um, all these crimes commit committed by the Belarus government and authorities uh, won't be forgotten because they are written down in this regional organization. Um, uh, this report included and verified information about such uh, matters of, yeah, as freedom of assembly, freedom of expression, and then media right to liberty and security, and moreover, lack of effective remedies. They concluded that the recent present election has been falsified and systematic human rights violations have been committed. Uh, committed. It is very important because, as I said before, this is the first um, organi international organization which is uh, governmental. Model. So members of government or other of other countries take part uh, take part uh, in this assembly, and it equals to the acceptance that um, human rights were truly abused abroad. Then. We move to UN and Human Rights Office. Mm. Mm. First of all, uh, they did not sincerely do much. Uh, they simply um, made, made first, firstly an urgent debate, which uh, which can be uh, read in the first part of my uh, of the slide, where we can read um, the statement by, by made by Nadia Al Nasif. Uh, who is UNA Deputy High Commissioner of Human Rights. It was held in September, and then we can read that I urge the authorities to fulfill their obligation under international human rights treaties. I encourage them also to engage in transparent, inclusive dialogue in place of, in place of violence and to guarantee that there will be no reprisals whatsoever against those who contribute to their ideas and demands. More was, uh, more was said in December by Michelle Bachelet, another UNA High Commissioner for Human Rights, during the intersessional meeting about the situation in Minsk. Michelle said that I regret to report that since the Council urgent debate on Belarus in September, there has been no improvement in human rights situation in the country. On the contrary, recent weeks have seen have seen continued deterioration, particularly with respect to the rights of peace, um, of peaceful assembly. Um, it appears that United Nations didn't do much, didn't influence in any way to calm down the, um, the issues which deteriorate in Belarus. However, one must remember that Belarus has not granted the United Nations access to the country for monitoring purposes. So United Nations simply do not have such rights and capabilities to do something more. So what's next? Um, what will happen? Uh, how, how it was in the end? Is it true that public statements made by these international entities did not influence in any way um, the protests in Belarus? Or is it wrong? First of all, it is fundamental to remember that the functioning of international organization is within the international law. And they simply do not have any or many tools to make a real impact due to restrictions of fulfillment of terms in good faith. However, it is possible to notice, thanks to the statements uh, which I mentioned before, 
that the international community has participated actively to promote the access to objective information and they consequently criticize the abusers. Uh, to conclude it, the violation of human rights cannot be tolerated and our international organization demonstrated it within their capabilities. Thank you very much uh, for the floor and for hearing me out. Thank you also for declaring your speech. And now we we finished with uh, presentations. We shall proceed to debates. So I'll like to ask my colleague Eric here to lead this debate. OK, thank you so much and hello again. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for those presentations. That was an incredible experience and uh, they were well prepared and knowledgeable. So uh, thank you to all of you. And uh, now proceeding to the, to the questions from the chat, we have three questions and um, maybe I should do this like to read those three questions and then we will uh, ask who want to answer, okay? So, first uh, question from uh, Kasper. Is it possible that coronavirus may create a huge economic crisis in Belarus? Second from Veronica. Question for Alexandra Ochkovich. What do you think? What is the biggest problem, challenge for the medical workers in Belarus in the current situation? And the last one, also from Kasper. Uh, Can we expect in this year some kind of civil war in Belarus? The protests are very peaceful comparing to them from the Ukraine and Romaidan in 2013. What kind of event must be triggered to overthrow the Lukashenko regime. And now, uh, what do you think about those questions and uh, who wants to, to actually to answer these questions? Okay. So maybe first. Maybe if I can answer okay. the question that was directed to me. So okay, thank you very please. much for this question. Um, it was very, it is very interesting question because um, it is not very easy to answer since there is a lot of factors that are influencing um, the, the current situation of medical workers in Belarus. But in my opinion, however, um, the, the most important, the biggest problem for medical workers in Belarus are, dare I say, um, the authorities who are basically sabotaging the work of medical facilities. Because how else can you name, can you call the fact that during the pandemic, during the protest where a lot of people are wounded um, and also, well, yeah, during the pandemic, um, the, the government decides to arrest uh, a huge number of medical workers. And because of that, the work of medical facilities uh, is totally disrupted. I mean, this poses a threat to, to the Belarusian nation because, you know, those people, the, the common citizens are deprived, deprived of health care. Um, according to, to some data, um, you, we can see that the doctors who are arrested and they spend, um, for example, 15 days in prison, uh, they, they do not see up to 200 patients. So you can imagine the, the biggest scale, the, how, how huge the scale is of this problem. And you know, the lack of personal that I've, I've mentioned before, this is, uh, I mean, this is a huge problem. It was a huge problem, but right now, uh, you know, the government seem, seems not to notice the fact that um, most of doctors are irreplaceable. So if we were in a situation that, um, you know, it is not so difficult to replace some, some doctors, uh, it would be different. But right now, there is, there is absolutely no one to replace them. So if common common citizen wants to see a doctor, uh, well, they, they cannot because doctor, doctors are arrested. And also what I would like to add is the fact that uh, in Belarus, we do not deal with the case that um, doctors are bad doctors. They do not know how to heal, how to treat patients. No, 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 it's, it's actually quite the opposite way. 
uh, Belarusian doctors are very skilled doctors. So they they know how to invest in in themselves. So that's also the reason why they decide to leave because they have more opportunities abroad than in Belarus. And right now, as I said, uh, the the biggest problem are the authorities basically who do not know how to properly act uh, towards uh, towards Belarusian uh, medical workers. And one little thing that I would like to add, because um, I see that I forgot to put the list of sources at the end of my presentation. So if anyone would be interested in the sources, please uh, message me and I will provide it to you. And also, I hope that I answered the question. If there are further questions, please ask. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, we are uh, getting towards next next question, uh, which is, I will repeat it, okay? Uh, is it possible that coronavirus may create a huge economic crisis in Belarus? So, um, I don't know. Uh, so maybe you will answer this question. Uh, for example, maybe our international guest from the University of Taru, is he there? Yes, I am here, but I don't uh, think uh, I am the right person to uh, okay. reply to the coronavirus question. Uh, I just uh, I, I can just say that uh, I think that it has already created and it was uh, a great element be behind the uprising, but uh, that's all I can say about it. Okay, uh, so uh, what uh, what do you say about uh, the civil war in Belarus? Maybe this is the third question. Yes, I'd say that was probably for me. So, uh, well, I cannot see the mechanism uh, of eruption of uh, a conflict that could be analytically uh, described as civil war. Because, uh, of course, it is uh, possible that uh, in case there is a rapid regime change, and, uh, for example, it doesn't uh, fit in the Kremlin's plans that they are trying to orchestrate some regional conflicts. But as mentioned, there uh, is no such regional fragmentation in Belarus that uh, there is in Ukraine. And that's a quite well documented fact. And uh, also, if you think about uh, civil war against Belarusian authorities or those uh, brought from Russia to act uh, on behalf of Lukashenko, uh, where, what would be the other side? You could say the other side is civil society, but uh, how would, uh, what, what would be their, the physical force behind them? There won't be any Western intervention on support of them uh, uh, by hard force or anything like that. That's something that uh, Lukashenko and uh, Putin try to uh, pose as a threat, but uh, that's not going to happen. Uh, so basically, where would they get the arms? It is not the United States of America where everyone is allowed to uh, bear arms and so on. So uh, I fail to see the mechanism how this kind of violence could be erupted. And uh, uh, I think these considerations are uh, behind that uh, the fact that the protests have been so peaceful. Also, I would uh, question the notion that uh, Ukrainian <laughs> protests were more violent. Uh, there were uh, probably more visible defensive actions uh, in in Maidan when they built some barricades and uh, when there were this uh, couple of hot heads with uh, questionable political beliefs supporting the protest. But uh, okay, we probably don't see it in Belarus, but we see people physically defending themselves. They are taking taking the balaclavas uh, from uh, Oman uh, troops and uh, they are. Uh, they are defending themselves, so they, they are not like uh, Mahatma Gandhi in that sense. Thank you. Thank you so much for the answer, interesting answer. Uh, so um, we are heading to uh, end uh, to our panel, our panel. So I would like to ask one last question. It is from me and uh, the question um, concerns uh, the health system, healthcare system. So um, I'm concerned with that because um, I was wondering about uh, what is the position, what is the statement of the officials from the, you know, for example, Ministry of Health in Belarus towards uh, 
Lukashenko and and towards uh, the statements of Lukashenko. And this is obviously a question for uh, Alexandra. So if you if you could. Yes, of course. Well, thank you very much, Eric, for this question. Um, well, when it comes to Ministry of Health, uh, obviously there are no antagonists of Lukashenko there because, you know, you cannot be in the government and being uh, against uh, the ruling president. So what they are basically saying, well, they are doing what Lukashenko says. I mean, uh, they are currently uh, reshuffling uh, basically every important position uh, in the uh, health industry, if you can say, say it like that, because all the hospitals, all the medical facilities are state owned in Belarus. So right now, uh, the, the directors uh, of these hospitals and also like um, the lecturers of state medical universities are being simply replaced uh, with the people who, uh, who are not against Lukashenko. There was a very, um, how to say, very loud case of, um, of firing Alexander Morocek. Uh, who was the director of uh, one of the biggest um, clinics um, for um, for heart diseases in in Belarus, um, and the the whole process of this is very simple because the Ministry of Health is just calling uh, these directors to themselves, and they're just informing them that they are laid off. No explanation provided, no basis, nothing. There is just information that you are being laid off. Um, so, Ministry of Health is currently doing nothing in order to, um, I don't know how to say, to, um, to, 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 to stop the violence against, uh, against the doctors. Basically, they do not even, um, they, they do not even recognize that there is a fact of violence against doctors. So, um, Ministry of Health could be called as the bad guy here also because they do absolutely nothing to protect uh, to protect the doctors and they are not also very um, very they weren't very great uh, in managing the pandemics in Belarus as the first speaker used to um, she 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 was talking about it so the p pandemics in Belarus wasn't also very well managed and. I would I would say that that's kind of the fault of Ministry of Health. Thank you. I hope this this answer answers your question. Yeah, that was satisfying for me. Thank you <laughs> very much. And uh, so, uh, unfortunately, uh, I'm afraid uh, we have to finish uh, our uh, panel number three. Thank you very much for the uh, discussion, interesting discussion. And thank you, thank uh, thank you to the. Um, you know the audience and uh, thank you for the questions so um hope to see you <laughs> and uh, one more time thank you for this fruitful discussion i'd like to thank you also uh, every one of you and i would like to invite our viewers to our next panel which starts in half an hour at quarter past five we're not finished yet for now, thank you for watching and have a nice evening. Yeah, have a nice evening. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye.